So this evening, we preaching on another subject that's kind of tied in with the events that have been going on this week and um, these things that, that have impacted me personally. And as I mentioned already um, a few times, I just want to make sure everyone understands, you know, that we have been receiving a lot of support when, you know, um, you might expect to be receiving a lot of hate, a lot of problems for taking a stand against the sodomites. We've been receiving a lot of support and it actually, it means a lot to me to be, to be just hearing from other people. It really is a good comfort. It really is a good help. It really helps you to be uh, encouraged and motivated to do even more. Uh, it, it always does that, right? I mean, the Bible talks a lot about getting our strength from the Lord and we need to trust in God. And, and of course, that should be at our heart and our root and our foundation. But it's also very helpful to be receiving extra support from believers, from other like-minded people to kind of band together and say, no, we're with you and show that strength and that support. And, you know, I, I after hearing from different people, I started to think, wow, I don't know if I'm being a good enough support for other people. And this is very important to understand this, which, which I thank God for the people who have already reached out and support in, in a time because you don't know what's going on. I mean, you don't know exactly what to expect. And I'm not saying that I would, like I'm coming close to wavering or buckling or anything like that, but there is anxiety and just, you know, the unknown of what's gonna happen is unsettling right? It's, it's, not, uh, it's not always fun to, to be going through that stuff, not knowing, am I going to lose my job over this? Am I going to, you know, just kind of unknowing. It doesn't, you know, my faith isn't wavering or shaken by that, but it's just, just when you have people saying, hey, we're here for you, hey, we're for you, it's very comforting and very uplifting. And I'm going to teach a sermon tonight. We're going to go through various portions of scripture that teach that. And one of the reasons why this is so important um, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Will means you want to, that you are trying to, you, know, you're, you, you want to live godly in Christ Jesus. Everybody, everybody, it says all, all that will live godly. You want to try to do the right thing. You want to follow Christ. You want to follow Christ's example. You want to preach to the lost. You want to do the work of the Lord. You shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. And if you find yourself never facing persecution, you have to ask yourself, am I living godly? Do I want to live godly in Christ Jesus? Jesus was the perfect example of someone that lived godly in Christ Jesus, right? He, he is the example. He is the person. And look at what happened to him. Did he suffer persecution? Of course he did. The most Christ-like person to walk this earth, Jesus Christ himself, it wasn't a cakewalk. Not everybody loved him. He had oppositions from many people. He had his own you know, friend to, pay, uh, to betray him, his own follower, his own disciple. Right? He, had, he had all kinds of things against him. He was a man well, uh, acquainted with grief and sorrows. This is Jesus Christ. This is our example. This is who we are supposed to be following. We can expect that. We should expect that. And the more that you try to live righteously and godly in this world, the more you can expect to just have persecutions. Now, it's not just continual persecution all the time. They come and they go. But if you're living godly, you can expect that they're going to come. And because you can expect that they come, all the more reason to make sure that you can be a comfort and support to everybody that you know that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Because it's important. Because we don't want our brothers and sisters in Christ who are, who will live godly in Christ Jesus, we don't want them to fall. We don't want them to stumble when the persecutions come. We want to be able to help them through. We want to be able to show our support to them. Be right there for them. 
That was actually part of the reasoning for the sermon this morning. Is I want to be able to equip people here because, let's face it when, it, when your church gets on put on the news and they want to slap a label that just says, hate group, hate speech, and then everyone else comes along and says, cult, racist, right? They just want to throw racist in there too, even though, you know, as I mentioned before, homosexuality is not a race, but they just want to throw that in there because it's just one more thing that they think they could, they could tack on to some list that they make up. But when, when this gets broadcast to the world, that this is, this is who this group is, this is who this church is, you can expect persecution from that. You can expect family members. You can expect other people, just acquaintances, coworkers, whoever, anyone that knows you go to that church or maybe they didn't know it before and they find, oh, you go to that church? Isn't that a hate group? People could come after you and expect to endure some persecution. We went through it, my wife and I, my family, when we went to Faithful Word Baptist Church. Her family saw us on the news walking into Faithful Word Baptist Church. And what happened? The phone call started, right? Now, oh, what are you doing? You, can't, you need to find another church. You need, you know, all the, the, the calls of not support. What are you doing there? What's this place all about? I'm, you know, I'm worried about you. I don't, you know, I don't want you getting hurt or getting in trouble or your safety. You got to think of your kids, all this other, all these reasons why you should get out of a on fire church for God that's doing the works of God, which is why it's being attacked in the first place. The comfort is, is much needed, especially in those times. And that's why I thank God for the people who have already reached out. People I don't know. I mean, yeah, a lot of my friends have encouraged me, and I appreciate that. And we ought to think of our friends, too, when they're going through their hard times. And that's why we have churches and pastors on our prayer list, because they're going through their own persecutions and their own hard times, and we want to at least be in prayer for those people. But it actually got me thinking when I started receiving this, this, you know, all the support. It's like, wow, I didn't, you know, I don't know if I've been that good of a, of a comfort and a support to other people. And it led me to even call Pastor Anderson, just tell him, hey, you know, thanks for standing up and being strong. Because when he was going through what he went through, it wasn't, it was way worse than anything. That, I mean, we didn't, this is nothing. Just being, getting a news story, I'm actually looking at this as just being a total positive for us. I don't even see any negative to it at all. But, um, you know, they went through things a lot worse, and he didn't have as many people backing him up either. He had very few people. So, I, you know, I just wanted to thank him. Hey, thank you back then. I learned a lot from that experience. I helped me grow, and I want to I be a comfort now to you, you know, that this is, you know, I appreciate what you've done. And, and, you know, I'm here for you. And I don't, you know, I feel like we don't always express that to other people. One of the, one of the people who called me up said, he, he said he was a pastor of another church. I don't know what the church is. He has said, you know, sometimes we can look at these things and just say, well, that's not my church, not my business and move on. And he said, but, and I forget his exact words now, but he was basically saying, but he wanted to be an encouragement and just let you know that, hey, we're standing with you that we agree with you, that we are, we are here to support you instead of just blowing it off and letting me, he said, we shouldn't just let each other hang out there to face all of the heat alone. So he's like, whatever you need from me, you want me to come down there, I'll stand with you. And I thought that was great. And like I said, I don't know anything about this guy. I don't know what he, what he teaches or what he believes, but that is the right attitude to have. And that is the right spirit to have. And that's what we're going to be learning about tonight and just looking through different examples because this actually happens a lot. And so you see a lot of examples of people bringing comfort, especially when persecution is going on. We're going to see a lot of you know, Paul being persecuted a lot and the comfort that he's receiving from individuals, from people, from people that he knows, from people sending comfort. And we need to bear this in mind that especially when other people are going through hard times, let's be there to support them. It's something as simple as a phone call, a text message, any way of just letting them know, hey, we support you, can actually do a lot of good for those people. 
and really be a big encouragement. Maybe you're the only person that does it and that still would be huge. I mean, they're not getting any support from anyone, but you know what, they hear from you, that is a big deal. And if it's gonna help that person not fall, if it's gonna help that person be a little bit more bold, be a little bit more uh, vociferous in their service to the Lord, then amen, you've done a great job. Let's look down here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. The Bible reads, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. There's a lot of comfort going on in those first two verses, right? So it seems to be what he's talking about uh, in verses 3 and 4 there. He's saying the comfort, of course, comes from God. He's the God of all comfort. But we can take the comfort that we get from God in our tribulations and then share that comfort with other people and they're going through their tribulations so that they can also experience the comfort of God. You see what he's saying there? That when God comforts our hearts, he, could use, he uses other people oftentimes to, to, to help with that comfort that he's laying on their heart. Hey, you comfort them. You know, you've been comforted in your hard times and now you go and comfort them. Verse number five, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So he's saying that they're receiving the sufferings of Christ, right? A lot, the, a lot of things that Christ went through, they're going through the same things. They were also being persecuted as they followed Christ. They were also receiving the persecutions that came upon Christ. But he says, also though, even though those sufferings abound, the consolation by Christ, the comforting, the consoling by Jesus Christ, that also abounded. We want to make sure that whatever sufferings and afflictions abound towards anyone, any brother or sister in Christ, any of the saints, we should be able to abound with the consolation on them and to them and help comfort them uh, in abundance. Look at verse number six, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And this just shows this whole mindset that they have towards others anyways, that the, you know, the Apostle Paul is speaking here. He said, whether we be afflicted or whether we be comforted, it's for your benefit. That's ultimately what he's saying in verse number six. Whatever is going on here, we could be suffering affliction, we could be being comforted, it's all for you. It's all for your benefit. Verse number seven, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. And he's encouraging them and giving them hope that, hey, just as much as you are enduring sufferings, you're also going to be comforted. It's also comfort to know, and I think this is one of the reasons why I said whether we afflicted is for your consolation, when you know other people go through things, it also can make it easier as well. When you have someone else that you know that you've seen go through hard times, they've suffered persecutions, afflictions, and then they came through all that, you say, oh, well, they were able to get through it. Let's look at that example. We could get through this too. This isn't some, uh, you know, force that just cannot be opposed. This is something that we can see ourselves through also and be comforted just knowing that other people have gone through even way worse. And of course, we go back to the, to the most extreme example or the best example is Jesus Christ. Look at what he has suffered through, what he has gone through for us. The Bible says, you have not yet resisted unto blood. You know, well, Jesus Christ has. He, he's been afflicted way worse. And, and I think, you know, unless, you know, depending on what happens with the Great Tribulation, if that happens in our lifetime, the way things are right now, it's still nowhere close to the affliction that many other people have suffered for Christ. And just understanding that should be able to help you through the hard times that you have within your family, with loved ones, with people who want to give you grief over your beliefs. Think about how much affliction is that really in the grand scheme of things? I mean, people disagreeing with you on your beliefs or, or calling you names or, you know, whatever they think about you. That's a very light affliction compared to what many other people have actually gone through physically as a result of their faith. 
Let's keep reading verse number eight. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. The Apostle Paul's writing unto the church at Corinth saying, you know, we need you to know about this. We don't want you to be ignorant of the trials and the, and the persecutions that we went through. He said, it was so bad. We were pressed so hard, out of measure, above our strength, that basically we wished we were dead. That's the, that's the level that the Apostle Paul and others had to endure in their service to the Lord, that it had gotten so bad that he said, we basically despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raised the dead. So he's saying the reason why we're even brought to that point, he said, so that we can trust in God and not in ourselves. We were pressed so hard out of measure that we wanted to die just so that we could realize why are we trusting in ourselves? We just need to completely trust in God. That's what he's saying here. And we need to have that same type of a mindset that you can be pressed and persecuted and suffer afflictions to the point to where you just feel like I want to die and be able to say, well, I'm just trusting in the Lord. And whatever happens is going to happen. Verse number 10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And he's, and he's given a credit to God. He said, even at that time, basically verse 8 said, who delivered us from so great a death. He delivered them from their persecution physically and he does deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He's going to keep delivering us. He's going to keep on looking out for and protecting us. Verse 11, ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. And he's saying, we know, basically he's saying, we know that you all were praying for us also and that that was helping us by you praying to God for us in our afflictions. Again, another reason why the prayer challenge is so important, why we need to be thinking about those, especially those who are being afflicted. That God will help to comfort those people. If you don't have any means of, of reaching out to them and comforting them, and even if you do, still being prayer for those people. Verse 12, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. For we write none other things unto you than that, than what ye read or than what you read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And um, that last verse there, being so minded of other believers, of other brethren, especially of other workers, He's saying, you are our rejoicing, and even as we are your rejoicing, that level of love towards other people doing the work of the Lord, that's where we need to be at. Where you really genuinely, in sincerity, in truth, care about other people to where you are feeling what they're going through, right? And, and empathizing with them and sympathizing with them and their troubles and praying for them and being concerned for them. And, and wanting to know how they're doing and, and just, just being there one for another. This is the, the, the love of the brethren that needs to be there. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Flip over to chapter 7. The Apostle Paul cares deeply about all the churches that he writes his epistles unto. And, and it's very evident that he cares about these people genuinely and deeply. And he's expressing that concern and that comfort with the people here while he's warning them and everything else. Um, he's explaining to them that, that, you know, you're going to go through a hard time, but we're here for you. Verse number four of second Corinthians seven reads, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And he's going to explain why. Why are you exceeding joyful in all your tribulation? For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, 
within were fears. And that's another important verse to remember. When you have people, people that are perceived to be very strong men of God, I would look at the Apostle Paul as a very strong man of God. Would you not? I mean, like, would anybody doubt that the Apostle Paul could be viewed as a very strong man of God? I mean, he did a lot for the Lord. But even he is saying, without, we're, I mean, there's fightings going on all around us. There's attacks, there's persecutions. Within, we're fears. Now, we know what the Scripture teaches. We know that we shouldn't be afraid of anything but the Lord. That is right. We should have no fear. But we're still human. Just because we know we shouldn't be afraid of things doesn't mean you're never going to be afraid of anything. And he's admitting, hey, without we're fighting, within we're fears. Again, the reason why the comfort is so important. Because when you see a man of God, even someone who looks like they're very strong, they are rock, they're not going to move, you don't know what's going on inside of those people. Outwardly, yeah, they're, they're plugging away. But you know what? It takes its toil on the inside. There's stress, anxiety, fear, you know, all kinds of things going on inside while you're fighting this battle while you're standing and opposing the forces that would oppose the Lord. And um, it could be nerve-wracking. And the Apostle Paul is, is basically commending them here for, um, for the comfort that he, that he has. And he says in verse number six, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. So it so said we received comfort Comfort how? Through a man. Through Titus. Titus coming to visit. Titus coming in to be that comfort. He comforted them. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So it wasn't even just Titus, but the, the news that Titus brought. So not only was Titus standing with Paul, which was a great comfort to Paul, he also found out that, hey, the whole church of Corinth, they're mourning, they're praying, they're concerned about you, they care about you, they love you, they want to know how you're doing. Titus brings that news with him to the Apostle Paul, and Paul hears this stuff. Wow, what a great comfort. He's got a whole church behind him as he's maybe locked up in a prison cell somewhere or stuck some other foreign place and he's got all these fightings without him and fears within and it seems like there's nobody by him and everyone's forsaken him, Titus shows up and he says, hey, you're not alone. And by the way, the whole church is worried about you. We're concerned about you. We're praying for you. We love you, Paul. Amen. That does a lot to lift the spirits. That does a lot to give someone the energy and the courage and the fortification to just keep moving forward, to keep doing what's right, not to quit, not to get out of the battle. Because let's face it, people oftentimes will quit the fight because it just gets too hard for them. And they get weary and worn out. And I think we could reduce the number of people that would back out of the fight if we had more people encouraging and comforting those that are in the heat of the battle. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Why am I preaching a sermon? Why? Well, one reason is because we're doing the prayer challenge, and I want you to be able to think about other people and really consider the people who are putting themselves out there that will live godly in Christ Jesus that may even be enduring persecution right now or other people that have been going through persecution. I think about people like Pastor Robertson, Logan Robertson, who's been displaced. He's been trying to follow the Lord. He left his home in New Zealand, went to Australia to start a church there, trying to serve the Lord, go out soul winning, do all this stuff. He gets banned from that country and kicked out of that country. We're basically the same thing that we're being accused of, essentially, a different context but the same thing, I mean, they're calling him a hate preacher. They're calling him all the things that they want to call us. 
Except over there, their laws are a little bit different, and, and you've got even more God-haters out there. They're able to, to get him expelled from the country. So his family's going through. I mean, when you hear about these things, you know what? When you see him, he looks like a rock. Amen. Praise God. He's going forward. Well, if I'm done here, then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to serve the Lord over here, and this is what we're going to do. And he's going to keep moving forward. But guess what? That takes its toll on a person. Don't just let that be an encouragement to you, which it should be, to see, hey, here's someone who's standing for the God. Here's someone who, who believes what he believes in. Take the time to pray for that man, to send him a message, say, hey, we're with you. We support you. We comfort you. We want to comfort you. We want to, we want to let you know that we're backing you. And if there's anything that you need, hey, let, you, let me know. We're here for you. It means a lot when you get the Titus to give you those good news, but then it leads a lot more to know, hey, it's not just Titus. There's a whole group of people behind me. That's enough to help you to keep moving forward. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 13. Verse number 13, the Bible reads, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men." forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. And he's explaining now to the people in Thessalonica, he says, for ye brethren, ye became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea and are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. He's saying, you have endured your own afflictions, your own persecutions of your own countrymen just like the churches in Judea suffered of the Jews. This, you know, a similar persecution that was going on in Judea, the Jews are just going after these churches. You know, he says, you know, these are the ones, they, they both killed the Lord Jesus, their own prophets, they persecuted us, they pleased not God, they're contrary to all men. This is the, the suffering and, and uh, afflictions they were enduring in Judea and Jerusalem and these areas. He's saying, you guys are going through the same thing. It's just your own countrymen, other people, basically doing the same thing. There's always going to be people who want to oppose God and resist God and resist the truth and fight against it. It's not just the Jews. They're not the masterminds behind all that's evil and wicked in the world. <laughs> I'm not saying that there aren't a lot of them that, uh, you know, that are involved in, in very wicked things, but the point is he's saying, you know, where you're, what's happening to you happened to us. You've got people in your country that hate God, that are trying to fight against you, just as we did. And the reason why is because you're serving God. Because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And that's exactly what they're doing. You're the followers of churches. Well, guess what? You're going to receive the same thing that the churches were receiving. You want to be a follower of Christ? Well, expect the same things, you know, or similar things that happened to Christ that happened to you. Verse number 17, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. This is, again, going to the heart of Paul, going to the heart of someone who loves the brethren, loving brethren in other areas, saying, look, we, were de we departed from you in presence. Physically, we weren't there, but in heart, we're right there with you. And endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. We've been wanting and desiring to get right back with you, to come for you, and to see how you're doing. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He said, we've been trying to get back to you, but Satan keeps on screwing up our plans and preventing us from getting back to you to spend time with you. Verse number 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming, for ye are our glory and joy. He said, our glory and our joy is tied up in you and how you live and how you serve the Lord. We love you. We care about you. Our desire is toward you. Is that the heart that's in you? Do you think about 
fellow saints, brothers and sisters in Christ that way? Do you care about them to the level that the Apostle Paul cared about them when he's writing these epistles? Because that's how we ought to love the brethren. Have a desire to encourage one another. This is another reason why I think it's so important to just, to just make it a priority to come to church. It is important not just for you and your learning and what you can gain, but how about being the comforter and being the supporter of other people? Someone else in this church might be experiencing difficulty, and you know what? You can help that person. Flip over to chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse number 1 reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know." For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. And what's he saying here? He's saying, well, <coughs> they sent Timothy to establish and to strengthen and to comfort the people in Thessalonica, the church there, so that no one would, would be moved or troubled by the afflictions that were coming upon the disciples that were coming upon them are coming upon everyone who's serving the Lord. And he's saying, just so you, we could remind you that we've already told you this. We've already said that we, that it says, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know, this shouldn't be anything new. We don't want you to be shaken up by this, but just to make sure we sent Timothy unto you just to, just to keep you grounded and found to comfort you. Why? It was that important to him. He cared about the people that much. He could have just said, well, we're off doing, getting other people saved. We're off doing other work. Timothy, you're more valuable. Come with us. We need to just keep on preaching the gospel over here. He didn't do that. He said, no, we sent Timothy over there to make sure that you are still comforted and grounded and, and continue to move forward and that you're not shaken and that all these tribulations and trials aren't going to discourage you and get you out of the fight. And he's basically, he's saying also, he said that our labor isn't in vain. I mean, you invest a lot of time and energy into people and to other believers and trying to strengthen them and get them to grow. You don't want them getting out of the fight. You don't want them just quitting church and going off and saying this is too hard. It takes a lot of work. Let's face it, it takes a lot of work to start becoming a very effective Christian. Someone who becomes very effective at winning other people to Christ, at being a good example unto others, at doing the work of the Lord. That takes a long time to get to that point. It's not something that happens overnight. People invest in you. Other people, teachers, other people willing to help disciple and, and to bring you up and to give you knowledge and to, and to take you out and do soul winning and everything else and just taking the time to, to teach and to train. Nobody wants that going to just be wasted. I don't want that to happen. Anyone in this church, that's for sure, and any other believers, anybody that I've had any influence on, I don't want you to feel like oh, I can't take the persecution and everything else. What a shame that would be if all it took was a little bit of comfort to keep people going, but then they just never get that and they're out. And all the work that was done up to that point, just gone. Because they quit. Because they couldn't handle it. Because no one was there to comfort them. No one was there to to help in their time of need. Verse number six says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. So again, now the Apostle Paul is hearing a good report from this church at Thessalonica. You know, Timothy comes back, he says, you know what? 
We didn't have to be worried. They're strong. They're solid. They're great. They remembered everything that they, they've been taught. They're still keeping up with the faith. And, uh, you know, he brought good tidings or faith, their charity, good remembrance. And that they also are desiring to see the Apostle Paul and other disciples say, we want, they want to see you just as much as you want to see them. They're looking forward for that day to reunite. And hearing that, that much more comfort coming back to the Paul and the disciples because you don't know what's going on over there. So now he hears that, lifts him up, lifts his spirit. He says, now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Verse number nine, for what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Prayer ideas. Night and day, praying exceedingly, we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. How about you pray how you can be a help and a comfort to someone else in their time of need? That was the mindset that the disciples had. That's the mindset that we ought to have. That's the mindset that Jesus Christ had. That is what the true definition of being a minister is. Minister to other people. It's not about you. Turn to Romans chapter 16. It's the last place I'll have you turn. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 4, 7 says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. There are many other examples. I wanted to just bring up a few where we see, again, the Apostle Paul is sending different people, and, and I want to know what's going on with them. Timothy, go over here. Titus, go over there. Take a kiss, go over here. I want to know what's going on with these people. I want to make sure that they're staying up with it, staying on board. I want to make sure they're comforted. Anything that you can do to help them out, go over there and be a blessing to them and help them out. And then when they bring back the report, hey, praise God, what a comfort. These people are still working hard and serving the Lord. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in faith. Amen. Romans chapter 16. We're going to close on this. It's not that long of a sermon tonight. It's a very simple concept, but it's something that I think that we all need to evaluate ourselves. And as I said at the beginning, look, I don't think that I've done as good of a job in this area as I could have. And it kind of smacked me in the face when I started receiving a lot of other support going, you know what? I'm not really supporting people how to be supporting I hear about and see other people going through trials and tribulations, but I don't think I'm doing enough to really show that, hey, I'm here to support you. I'm with you. I'm comforting you. I've done it from time to time, but I mean, that's just something that makes me realize, you know what? There needs to be more of that. Romans 16 is a very interesting chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter. And I want you... To look at all of the names that are being mentioned here and consider the Apostle Paul knows all of these people by name and he's addressing all of the, and think about how many people there are. And these are not people that are with him on a regular basis traveling around. These are people that he's known just over his years of ministry, and these are people in Rome, right? But he's been all over the world. And then realize that we have this one whole chapter here, which is full of names. What about all the other places he's been that I believe he knows the names and is considering and praying for? He's praying for Thessalonica. He's praying for Corinth. He's praying for Rome. He's praying for all of these different places, all these people, all these fellow laborers, all the time. I mean, on a regular basis, he's praying for these people. And he cares about them enough to know them, to think about them, to remember them. Not just, oh yeah, weren't you the, just that person I went soul winning with? When? No. He knows exactly who they are, and he continues to know them because he's, continue, he's thinking about them and praying for them. Let's read Romans 16. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, I command unto you Phoebe, our sister, 
which is a servant of the church, which is at Sancreas. So he's referencing another church and saying, hey, Phoebe's coming unto you. I'm commending her to you. Take care of her, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a sucker of many and of myself also. So he's telling hey, be good to this woman. She's, she's done a lot of good, and, uh, and she's going to come unto you. Make sure you take care of her. Verse number three, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the well-beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. We're going to keep reading, but just, I mean, look at all the names. I actually didn't, I, I probably should have counted beforehand. How many people is he addressing here? Just, just the number. Because in many places, it's more, I mean, we're at verse, we're at verse 14, but he's mentioning in some of these verses more than one person in that verse. Now, we have read a couple other verses that didn't name names. But someone do that. Count through all, every single verse and, and, uh, and tell me what the number is by the time we get done with this. Verse 14, salute Asyncritus. I mean, he's saluting people. I don't even know how to pronounce their names. <laughs> but he remembers them. That's a feat in and of itself. Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. One, two, three, four, five. Five names in that one verse that he's just bringing up. Hey, salute these people. Tell them I said hi. Tell them I'm thinking about them. Tell them I'm praying for them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Quartus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now we see, I know we said we're going to read, this. well, I'll just, I'll read the last few chapters, the last few verses. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Notice that not only is he saluting all of these people in that first half of this chapter, he's also saying, well, and now these people with us. And he lists about, you know, six or seven people there saying, we all are saluting you. And we're all, um, um, you know, basically speaking with you. And this is coming from all of us. Go through the New Testament and see how many people that the Apostle Paul knows and is thinking about and is praying for and cares about. It's a lot. And I'm not saying you have to get a lot of friends to be right with God. But what I'm saying is when you meet brothers and sisters in Christ, get to know them and care for them and think about them and pray for them 
and especially those that you labor with. Now, look, I know you're not going to know all of the names of all the people. I don't think the Apostle Paul knew all the names of everybody he ever came into contact with. But there are a lot of people that he knew, that he worked with, that he went soul winning with, that, he, you know, that, that were in these churches, that, that he worked with on a regular basis. He got to know, and he cared about, and thought about them, and prayed for them, and comforted them, and did his best to reach out to them and make sure they're doing well. This is important in the Christian life because everyone who's going to live godly is going to go through their own persecutions and tribulations and hard times. We need to be there for each other. That is one of the big reasons for the church, for us gathering together, exhorting, encouraging one another to help each other through the difficult times. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for bringing together this group of like-minded believers into this place that we could learn and grow. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to grow together uh, closer in, in love and in unity of spirit, Lord, and that you would just guide us and teach us and direct us and instruct us, God, and help us um, to continue to, to be encouragement to others especially those who are going through very difficult times. And uh, even though we can't see what's going on inside of a person, Lord, we know that even if the Apostle Paul was able to make the statement, uh, without we're fightings, within we're fears, that we know that, that that's probably going on in the hearts of many other people, Lord. And I pray that you would please help us to be a comfort, to be a blessing, and to support those that are going through, that are suffering for Jesus' sake. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.